Welcome to today's episode of the Back in Shape podcast. Today we're going to be talking all about why hip degeneration is commonly associated with lower back injuries and really why many with lower back problems are going to have some element of hip problem. And this could be that it's a diagnosis of hip degenerative change, osteoarthritis, it could be just hip dysfunction, it could be glute tendonitis, it could be greater trochanteric bursitis, the list goes on. But basically, degradation of the tissue, soft or hard, in the hip and why that, it really makes a lot of sense. But Conversely, it really throws a lot of people. We have people in the membership and in clinically over the years, you know, they're, they're doing their work for their lower back injury, and maybe it's been there for quite a long time, and then some scan that they've had or imaging that they've had has diagnosed a hip problem as well. And it kind of really throws people, and hopefully by the end of today's episode, you'll really have an appreciation, if this is you specifically, that it kind of really makes sense and it, it's it's not something to be concerned by in so much as you're already probably if you're if you're doing the sort of stuff that we would recommend for your lower back you're already going to be covering some of those bases and it's very very rational and reasonable that the things that have led to your lower back problem have also had a negative impact on your hip as well so with that out of the way if we kick off with just talking about why the one is related to the other. Now, we can we can make the exception, and for those of you that are just listening only, I'm just holding up the spine here to just demonstrate the location of these two areas. But we've got the lower back here, and that's mobile, and we've got the sacroiliac joints here, and then we've got the hip. Now, for all intents and purposes, you can't move your sacroiliac joints, so we're kind of gonna disregard that one for today anyway. And really, the hip and the lower back are two joints that have to transmit forces from the ground going back up into the body and vice versa through to one another. The way in which they're going to be functioning on a daily basis is going to impact the other one. And many of the things that we see and observe that lead to lower back pain, excessive sitting for long periods, weakness, the muscles that we're talking about that weakness developing in is going to, yes, of course, be the core and the lower back muscles, but the glutes, the hamstrings, the hip flexors, all of these muscles are going to span both the lower back, but or involve the lower back, but they're also going to have an impact on the hip specifically because many of them actually cross that joint and work explicitly on it as well. So it's very, very common that these two are going to run side by side. If we have weakness, in those muscles that is affecting our ability to stabilize our lumbar spine. And we've got a disc injury down there, we've got some sciatica, we've got maybe some more degenerative change in the lower back. It's not unreasonable that we've had those pathologies there or those factors there for a significant degree of time that's been affecting the lower back. They will also have been affecting the hip as well. If we think about the big one, it's going to be the way in which we use our body on a daily basis because that's what builds up over time. Many of us are going to be sitting for extended periods of time. Well, when you're sitting, you're not using these muscles, the hamstring group, the hip flexor group, the glutes. You're not going to be using those muscles properly. You're also not going to be taking your hip through a full range of motion. You're gonna spend most of your day with your hip in this position here at 90 degrees or something like that. And maybe when you stand up, you almost get it to vertical but we never go all the way to extension. We never push that hip into extension. Now, those specific movements in the hip, we have to understand that when we are in a flex position, so that's with our knees up in a sitting position, the hip is a bit decompressed. It dis decompresses ever so slightly because we need to allow that range of motion, that's the way in which the hip functions. And generally speaking, when the hip is really high up like so, in that sitting position, it doesn't have to be as strong, so it can have a little bit more mobility. But when the hip is locked out, it's all, or well, not locked out, but into the load bearing position, so in that position there, 180 degrees between the upper body and the legs, or a little bit further back into full extension. It really does compress and lock in place nicely. Now, if we're never using these synovial joints on a daily basis through their full range of motion, the health of these synovial joints, which are cartilage, cartilage, and then they've got synovial fluid in the middle, which gives the cartilage its nutrition. We've got synovial membrane, which secretes the fluid, etc. If we never move these joints thoroughly through their full range of motion on a daily basis, they start to degrade. And that's where the process of specific hip degeneration or arthritis sets in because we're just not using our body very effectively. And think about it, if that is happening, and we're getting that de degeneration effect happening in the hip, what sort of things have we been doing for our lower back? We've been sitting for long periods. We've been maybe bending over when we're not standing up straight. We haven't ever been stood erect, holding all those erector muscles to actually support our spine effectively. So it's no wonder we have lower back problems. The thing is that the, the lower back is a little bit more vulnerable, those discs, etc., a little bit more vulnerable. So we become aware of that degeneration, that damage, that injury a little bit sooner sometimes than is with the hip, especially if it's a more slow degenerative process. Things just gradually get worse over time in a way that you don't even notice. That's the big thing with things like hip degeneration 
situation. You don't really notice it and still until you do, in so much as you can't quite fully extend your hip. Well, you never stand up straight anyway, so you don't ever notice that you can't fully extend the hip. Maybe on a very rare occasion, you notice your hip goes backwards. Perhaps maybe you did some sort of, you lunge down to do something and you know, oh, my hip can't quite go back there. And you don't think about it any more than that because you never go into that position anyway. And then all of a sudden, your hip kind of can't really straighten up anymore. You can't get the hip to actually stand up straight. So you're rounding over. And before you know it, you're kind of hunched over a little bit more unable to actually straighten up and whenever you do all of a sudden that hip hurts so we move less and less and less and there's this very slow process we almost allow ourselves to do less because it's a little bit uncomfortable if we go against that process of degeneration and all of these things are having effects hopefully if you're watching this and you're someone who's in the back shape program or has a back problem all of these alarm bells should be ringing that you're getting yourself stuck into positions that are disadvantageous for the lower back and that is a real highlighting point for why these two issues are so closely related. Now, I can't speak in terms of going forwards from here. I can't speak on what you might be doing if you're not part of the program. Yes, some of the exercises that people are given, the common ones, knee hugs, pelvic tucks, all of those sorts of things are exercises that actually just focus to the lower back. So if you're doing those sorts of exercises, not only are they wrong in our opinion, but you're actually not doing anything for the hip. So if you had that lower back diagnosis and you're working with those exercises, as wrong as that might be, um, then you wouldn't actually be doing any hip work. So you'd need to do some specific hip work. But if you're in the program, in our program anyway, you'll notice that many, if not all of the major exercises, yes, there are accessories there which don't apply to this rule, but the major ones, things like the squat, the lunge, the hip hinge, etc., even the dead bug, the marching bridge, all of those exercises actually work with both your lower back and your hip at the same time and the musculature that interplays between those two or across those two regions. So the good news for those of you that are in the program, hopefully that earlier part of this of this episode has, has helped you understand a few more things, but you're already doing the right exercises, even if you do have hip problems. And I would argue that many of you will have hip dysfunction in so much as you can't use your hip as it is designed to do so without things going awry, without maybe a squat. You cannot squat down to the floor without things going wrong. The knees going into the wrong place, the ankles collapsing in, the lower back rounding, all of these sorts of things happening. And that just really shows or is testament to the fact that these two areas are so interrelated. But the good news is you're already working on it. You're doing work through those squats, lunges, etc., to start to strengthen the musculature of the hip which will improve the health of the hip, as well as the lower back and the interplay between those two, which is so very vital. So the good news there is you're already doing the right sort of things. But in terms of addressing that going forwards, what are we going to prioritize? Well, hopefully to round this video off, I'll give you a nice principled understanding of whether it's hip or whether it's lower back, whether it's ankle, elbow, shoulder. Focus first on strengthening the musculature of the hip. And that's not stretches. Sometimes people come in, uh, or we used to come into the clinic, and we say, yeah, I've been given some strengthening to do. I'm doing a hamstring stretch. And, and, and that's not your fault if, you, if you've fallen into this trap before. But understand that strengthening exercises are specific types of exercises done in a specific way. And stretching is not strengthening. Knee hugs are not strengthening. Pelvic tucks are not strengthening. Strengthening proper objective strengthening exercises are things like squats are things like hip hinges or deadlifts, things like split squats or lunges, things like hip thrusters or bridges. Those four are probably the best exercises that you could use as measures and markers for your strengthening of your hip, as well as the strengthening of your lower back. And the great thing is it teaches you how to use the two together with one another correctly and you can always slowly scale every single one of those exercises almost infinitum because you can add resistance bands, you can add weights, you can do all sorts of things to make them harder as you get stronger and that will help you build that up. So whether it is that you've got some trochanteric bursitis just over here because the quality of the soft tissues in that area, the common glute tendon, the IT band, the, um, the musculature in that region is not working properly, it's not strong, it's not flexible, then you can work on that to build the strength there. Whether it's other issues like the IT band tendonitis or glute tendonitis, strengthening up those muscles will help because you will be providing the stimulation through those tissues to reduce, to, 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 uh, to signal adaptive change and reduce the vulnerability of those tissues. And slowly over time, it doesn't happen overnight, but slowly over time they will get stronger and healthier and healthier and that will improve the health of 
the hip, which again has that knock-on effect on the lower back, but strengthening comes first. We also have a degree of balance and skill, and that is the ability to deploy these muscles in a way that keeps balance. For example, that's form, that's technique. For example, on a squat or a lunge or a split squat, the knees being held steadily in place, the ankle and lower limb being held steadily balanced whilst you're doing whatever exercise you're doing. That skill component is very important. And then finally, not first, but finally, adding in that degree of flexibility. Because nowadays, more or less everyone, apart from the elite athlete has just injured their lower back or just injured their hip. They have a team of specialists in most cases that are taking care of them, monitoring them, and giving them the right interventions immediately to help them. But the average person, most of you guys watching this, will not be in that category. You will not be as strong as you need to be. And by focusing on flexibility in a mistaken manner, you create more mobility in an area that is already struggling to deal with the mobility that it already has. Focusing on strengthening allows the muscles to become more competent and happy with allowing your body to go through a greater range of motion. And then, as we notice that maybe we have been pushing strengthening pretty well, we've been making some significant progress, we can say, hey, do you know what? I need a little bit more range of motion in my hip. Maybe my hamstrings are a little bit tight and we need to elongate those. So we can work purposefully to start to improve the flexibility of the hamstrings. But if you didn't, haven't already seen it, checking out last week's episode, I believe it's episode number 16, where we talked all about stretching of the hamstrings specifically you'll understand why in much more depth, why that stretching is not a good idea first and foremost. It comes after we've done some significant strengthening. So hopefully, as always, there is a comment section. Hopefully this has made a lot of sense to you guys. If you've got any questions, use the comment section. Whether, it's, whether you're watching this on our website, whether you're watching it on one of the other platforms, ask us any questions. If anything didn't quite make sense, maybe you're worried about your specific hip issues and how they may be playing into the lower back or whether you're doing the right sort of exercise or whether this applies to you. Post in the comments, let us know. And if you do find these videos helpful, remember you can always give us a thumbs up or subscribe to whatever platform you're watching this on. But thank you so much for watching this far and we will see you in the next episode.